the imposter syndrome feeling came in because I was like, well, if I can't heal myself and work in the way that I want to, you know, want to work and hold this career and for a lack of a better term, live my purpose, who am I to be an atropath and be helping other people heal? So that became like that, you know, crazy kind of conversation that you have in your mind where you go back and forth a lot. You're listening to The Creative Imposter, episode number 54. Welcome to The Creative Imposter. I'm Andrea Klunder, and I have a question for you. Have you ever gotten health or healing advice from a doctor or other health practitioner and felt like they just weren't listening to you? or believing what you had to say? What if you could get high-level intuitive health advice from a hip holistic healer with a strong clinical naturopathic background and hot pink or blue or purple hair, depending on the day? What if she could guide you to get in touch with your own body's natural cycles and biorhythms? What if your treatment recommendations included food, herbs, flower essences, and essential oils? And what if you could get that consultation from the comfort of your own home? Today, I'm bringing you a conversation with Australian naturopath Samantha Mant. Samantha is another incredible feminine leader and entrepreneur that I have connected with via Isabel Rizzo's Singularity Circle. Working with Samantha is like Learning about yourself through the kind advice and insight of a good friend who happens to be super smart and wise. In fact, she's so good at listening that I talked about myself way too much in this interview and probably should have paid her for a consultation, to be honest. But she is so generous with her expertise and you are going to love her. I actually recorded this interview back in the summer and have been waiting for this series on self-care to share it with you. Be sure to stick around to the end of the interview where Samantha gives some tools for increasing your creative self-confidence and even her top tips for staying healthy and sane during the holiday season. Speaking of which, I want to take just a moment to thank some of my colleagues for supporting the creative imposter this season. It's my birthday month, and they sent me a gift of digital self-care downloads beautifully packaged online called The Season of You. Featuring guided meditation, lush visuals, a self-care scavenger hunt, and more, it's the perfect gift for you to receive or to give to another creative woman in your life. You can check it out at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash season of you. And of course, it is quite conveniently linked in the show notes for this episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash zero five four. The Season of You is super affordable and available on a sliding scale. If you decide to get one and or gift one, you will be directly supporting this show as well. It's a win for you, for me, and for these dynamic women who put it together. So specifically, thank you to meditation teacher and artist Elizabeth Tuckwell, Dr. Paula Ann Hennen, who I met at Podcast Movement this year, family advocate Rachel Cartmel, and coach Simone Ryder. Okay. Back to naturopath and holistic healer extraordinaire, Samantha Mant. Here is our super timely conversation. So you don't know this, but you're actually indirectly one of the reasons why I even signed up for Isabel's program in the first place. Because Isabel came to a brunch, like a creative women's brunch that I host here in Chicago. She came and she presented and she had a little PowerPoint presentation about her work. And one of the things that she did in her presentation was instead of talking all about herself, she talked about all of her fabulous clients. And she had photos and like your little bio and was talking about how this client is doing this amazing, awesome thing. And this client is doing this amazing, awesome thing. And I was like, I want that. I want somebody in my corner who's like promoting me and my services and going to events and telling other people about what I'm doing. That's what I want. And you were one of those people that she was promoting. And I was like, oh, her clients look so cool. (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. (laughs) How great is 
Isabel's so amazing. She's like having this fiery little kickboxer in your corner, and I, I love her. Totally. I love that description. <laughs> but clearly, I know what your work is, and I know what it is you do. But why don't we start off by having you just share a little bit about who you are, what your mm-hmm. work is, and the third part is what you're most excited about right now in your work. Oh, big questions. Okay, so I am a naturopath, which is a doctor of natural medicine, and that's really based on holistic medicine. So I help people realize their own healing blueprint in their bodies, and I educate them on how to use that blueprint when they need to bring their health back into balance. So we call that constitutional medicine, but a healing blueprint sounds a bit nicer and easier to understand. And part of this is also helping people to tap into and trust their own intuition when it comes to nudges they are giving themselves in regards to what they feel they need to take care of themselves. So our body actually does, you know, tell us, oh, eat seasonally, get plenty of rest, but we tend to ignore it a lot of the time. (laughs) So this was the next part what I'm most excited about Mm -hmm. in my, okay. I'm really excited at the moment because I'm writing a course teaching people how to get really connected to their intuition and using seasonal cycles and moon cycles to understand how their body goes through its own cycle and its own rhythms throughout the year and to unlock and unleash different aspects of healing within themselves. That's so important what you are doing and what you're teaching. I know for me, I'm one of those people who I dread going to the doctor And I always make it my last resort. And it's not because I'm afraid of the doctor or I don't want to know what's wrong with me. But I feel that a lot of times in our Western model of medicine, we give up agency of our own health and well-being. And we kind of turn over the expertise to somebody else. And we say, oh, well, the doctor is the expert. The doctor must know more than I do. Yeah. And, you know, you spend five minutes sometimes with a doctor and you see a different one each time and they can't really get to know your whole body and how it works and how it communicates with each system. They're only kind of looking at one system. So really, we we have so much more insight to our own body and what works for us than anyone else. Like even if I was to spend two hours with a patient, they still know better than I do in in most circumstances. And my job is to really just put them on a path with goals. And then sometimes it takes a lot of tweaking because you don't always get it right the first time. It's a journey. Healing is, is a journey and I get to hold space for people and I feel really honored that I get to hold space for people when they want to heal. That's really special. And I know that you say that we know best, like we know our own bodies best, and we know we have this innate intuition, our bodies have this intuition of what we need for healing. And yet, I think that we are because of of how we're taught, you know, in this current medical system or medical uh, philosophy, we don't necessarily know how to tap into that intuition. So we may have the intuition, the body may have this wisdom available somewhere in it. But sometimes we don't necessarily know how to interpret it or how to feel it. Or what's the difference between I'm having a craving for ice cream versus (laughs) my body actually wants this other thing that is not ice cream at all. And like, is it a craving? Or is it an intuition? So I think there's a lot of confusion. And maybe just yeah. not even knowing how to trust our body's messages that it's sending it. So what are some of the tools that you use to help your clients? Do you say clients or patients? I say clients. I think that's a bit more friendly. Okay. So uh, <laughs> what are some of the tools that you <laughs> use to help your clients get more tuned into their intuition when it comes to health and healing? Well, I really like the topic that you brought up there how do I know if something's a craving that uh, is like an addiction or is it a food addiction or is it something instinctively telling me something more so we have three kinds of cravings in the body that are triggered one is food addiction so like you know sugar and salty foods and all the other things that can be addictions as well we also have comfort craving which can come from like foods from our childhood And then there's an intuitive craving. So, you know, it's strawberry season 
and you really want strawberries or it's coming into winter and citrus fruit is really readily available and you want to drink lemon water, water tea all the time or something, that's an intuitive nudge. So the confusion comes from we don't understand how to break those down and we've had so many, I guess, we, we have misinformation given to us about our body a lot and food is used in like this reward system a lot too with parenting which can make everything get a little bit askew. So I like to help people break down when it comes to food those three areas and then we can start sort of unraveling into you know what is an addiction why you're addicted to that what is something else telling you so like if you're craving ice cream you're probably emotionally out of sorts there's something that you're craving emotionally comfort or it could be that your body is craving fats as well because ice cream's high in fat so we'll turn to like good fats that you might want to swap it out for like nuts and seeds and avocados and things like that and then sometimes that curbs the craving but you also need to understand the underlying emotional thing that's pinning that down did that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It's so complex. And that's why having a guide to help you navigate that, you know, someone <laughs> yeah. who has studied this and, and has some, it's sort of like you're like, um, you're like an intuition detective. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Actually, I, f I do feel like that when I'm helping people and sort of unravel their blueprint, it, it is like, detective squad like you're looking at all these clues and then painting a picture and then helping them form a picture as well that helps them understand themselves so yeah it is a bit like that profiling <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so food and nutrition is a huge area that you work with with your clients what are some of the other tools that you use in your practice besides food um, I really love herbalism. One of the first things I studied was actually herbalism. Um, and I became a herbalist like within two years of my studies and started practicing it almost straight away. And um, that's one thing I really love. But at the moment, because I'm just working from home, I don't have a dispensary. So I can't make up my own potions, which is super frustrating. But I like to, I can definitely help people make like their own herbal teas and herbal infusions and stuff and that's one of my favorite things to sort of prescribe homeopathy is something i also do um that's actually an extra on top of naturopathy not all naturopaths are homeopaths um i love aromatherapy i also did aromatherapy and shiatsu massage and lymphatic drainage massage which is a very gentle massage that helps your lymphatic system detox I study so many things, and I, I guess those are the things that I use the most, the modalities I use the most. And briefly, what is the actual difference between homeopathy and naturopathy? Okay, so homeopathy is its own complete form of medicine. Homeopathy is, like, naturopathy is based on nature cure, so we use anything that is available to us in nature that can heal, we use to heal. So sunshine, good food, good water, rest, you know, all those really great things. And then homeopathy is medicine that has been developed out of naturally occurring substances, like even rocks and minerals and spider venom, but also herbs and plants and things like that. And that's been formulated to help in a very structured way. Like it's a very structured medicine, it's very powerful. There's a complete and utter like strict way of prescribing it and looking at the body and how you're going to use it, which is why I'm not a big fan of the stuff that you buy from the chemist that is like homeopathic mixes and stuff. But that's not always going to help everyone because it's not specifically tailored to someone and their symptoms. Mm. And it's often usually very, very weak in its potency as well. So really going to a homeopath if you want to experience homeopathy and just how powerful and amazing it is, um, is definitely where it's at. And so you mentioned briefly that when you first started studying, you were very drawn to herbalism. And though I know a lot about your work, I don't actually know a lot about your story of how you got into this healing field in the first place. I know that there's something to do with your own personal health journey, but can you tell us a little bit about your personal story? Oh, I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> so when I was five years old, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, and the five years after that, I was 
of course, thrown into the medical system. And this was back in 87 that I was diagnosed. So it was very new back then for children to be diagnosed with autoimmune diseases. And so I was kind of a little bit of a lab rat to the medical system for a while. And the medication that I was on was very intense. So by the time I was 10 years old, I was very, very sick because everything sort of was like being trialed on me and I was on a bunch of medicines all at the same time. And I don't know if anyone listening knows the kind of medication they use for autoimmune diseases, but a lot of them have side effects that actually exacerbate the condition in the first place. So it really doesn't make much sense. So my parents, who were kind of at their wits end because they were seeing me get sicker and sicker, my mom took me to a naturopath and her name was Robin Morrow. And she was amazing. She just sort of made me open my eyes to healing in this whole other way. And even from a young girl, I kind of was really interested in healing modalities and I wanted to be a doctor at first and then I changed my mind and I wanted to be a physiotherapist. But when I met this naturopath, I was like, this is it, this is what I want to do. Everything makes so much sense. And I started to feel better and I went into remission. So my disease wasn't active anymore. And I came off all my medication. <laughs> so when I was 15, I went back and I saw this naturopath and she was like, oh, why are you still at high school? Like you've got your junior high school certificate. Just come and study at my college because she had a college that was coinciding with her clinic. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. So I walked out of that consultation with her, went next door and signed up. <laughs> and my parents were also so compliant and very supportive of everything that I do. So they were behind me 100%, which was great. And that's sort of how it, I guess it started. And I haven't looked back really. I've done that ever since I was 15. <laughs> and now you work from home and you've been incorporating more and more of an online component to your business. And when we first met, you were experimenting with doing consultations remotely via Skype which is actually the only way that you're able to work with me since you are in Australia and I am in Chicago. <laughs> and it's know, funny it's because great. I have somebody recently was like, oh, Andrea, do you have a recommendation for a naturopath in Chicago? And I was like, no, but I have one in Australia. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm like, That's... I, it's great because it's given me this reach like all over the globe to you know, work with people in the UK and all over North America and all over Australia. I just feel really excited about that. I had to sort of come to an online space because my health sort of deteriorated. Well, I had some issues with my ankle, which meant I couldn't be as active as I wanted to be. So working from home would be the best option for me. And at first, that was very difficult to sort of get to terms with. But in the end, it's really flourished and, and been something much more amazing than I could have thought possible for me in the work that I was doing, which I feel, you know, lucky about, Thanks, thankfully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And one of the things that I think, too, with having the online component of your practice, and one thing that was appealing to me to want to work with you is that you have this whole other aspect to your brand. Like you in the online space, you have the opportunity to not be as clinical necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know, you have the freedom to create this witchy brand that you bring in <laughs> to who you are and how you promote yourself and how you position your particular vibe. Tell me how that evolved, like the name of your Facebook group and everything like that. It really just sort of was an organic transition. And it was definitely cheered on by Isabel. Um, <laughs> because she was like, Oh, I have so many friends that are into like the witchy sort of side of it anyway, like branching into your intuition and using the, the moon cycle and the menstrual cycle and, and astrology even and all these other things. So it kind of just evolved that I was like, well, this is who I am and I don't have to fit into anyone else's clinic and be like with super professional, like straight laced <laughs> kind of naturopath. I can just be completely myself and work with the people that really kind of get me in what I do. And then I started really attracting those sorts of clients that kind of wanted something extra to the naturopathic consultation. And tell us the name of your Facebook group since I refer to that. Oh, my Facebook group is called the Holistic Branch Cauldron. So it's a little bit of a play on that. Like my website is the Holistic Branch, but 
my Facebook group is where people that really connect with me can kind of join and a little a little bit more witchy, crazy cuckoo stuff goes on in there or woo-woo stuff as people like to, to call it these days. And I thought it was a bit cheeky and a bit fun to call it a cauldron. <laughs> <laughs> and since this podcast is centered around the idea of imposter syndrome when it comes to creativity and Everyone that I interview here on the show is somebody who I personally think is in some way taking a creative risk in their work and stepping outside of the box and trying something new or pushing the envelope or exploring something in a new way, which puts us in a space of creative vulnerability in a way mm -hmm. where we're mm -hmm. subject to criticism, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, you know, who is this naturopath talking about cauldrons and <laughs> you know, moon cycles and I think I cover a lot of taboo like I'm a self-proclaimed witch I'm a naturopath I'm a feminist I'm a vegan I kind of tick all the the internet's taboo boxes <laughs> which is wonderful and inspiring but you know there's some risk involved so can you tell yeah. us of a time or an instance or an area in which you have felt any symptoms of imposter syndrome or felt self-doubt creep into what you were doing sure. or what you're creating? Yeah, well, actually, I could go back to when I had to stop working in a clinic because of my ankle. That was a really rough time for me. I felt I, I was in a lot of pain. So I kind of didn't feel like I was really at my A game when I came into to work. And I was having to really cancel on a lot of clients as well. So I had to really sit with that reality that working in a clinic wasn't for me at that time, still isn't. And that was hard because I had really had this projection in my mind that I would work in a clinic and one day I'd open up my own clinic and, you know, all those sorts of dreams that you have when you, you start you start a career. So I took a couple of years off and then I had some surgery on my ankle, but the surgery kind of was like not really helping I was kind of still in a bad place uh, physically but then mentally I it, it was a bad place too because I was like well what am I going to do now and luckily I had a lot of friends that were still messaging me asking me for advice naturopathically because I and I think that was kind of what kept pulling me through the idea that yes I still needed to do this and I the imposter syndrome feeling came in because I was like well if I can't heal myself and work in the way that I want to, you know, want to work and hold this career and for a lack of a better term, live my purpose. Who am I to be an naturopath and be helping other people heal? So that became like that, you know, crazy kind of conversation that you have in your mind where you go back and forth a lot. And then my sister one day said to me, why don't you start a blog? And if you have a blog, then you can write articles on certain topics. You can link people to them. It'll be like this really neat, structured place where you have information put and people can find you. And I was like, oh, that's actually a really good idea. But it still took me maybe 12 months <laughs> to start actually doing that. It was, again, a, a very vulnerable feeling because I was like, oh, I'm putting myself out there again, setting myself up for something that might not work. It might, it might fail. And I don't know if I could take another failure on this path because it means so much to me. But I, uh, you know, kind of gave myself a good talking to. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it. And I just started it. I just sort of ran headfirst into creating a blog, then educating myself on how to use the internet, how to write essays that kind of would bring people to me. How, and then I wrote a few essays also for Witch Magazine, um, Carolyn Elliott's magazine, which brought me a lot of uh, new like followers on Facebook and followers to my blog. And then it kind of just rolled on from there. I met Isabel, as we said, and she really helped me to sort of see the potential in, in what I was doing and take it further. And she's really great at sort of supporting you and making you feel like you are safe. And then even though it does feel vulnerable, that's an indicator that that is something that you really desire. That's why fears come up around, you know, our true desires and our true wants in life. So I just really took those risks and it's paid off. <laughs> 
I love that you said that, that when those feelings of fear come up let me see if I can say this correctly when those feelings of fear like the fear of failure or whatever come up that's a good indicator that you're on the right track because it means that it's something that's really important and something that you really desire and one question that I like to ask sometimes is whether you think imposter syndrome has a useful purpose for creative people oh absolutely I actually kind of think that if you don't have that (laughs) if you don't have that feeling then maybe you're not doing the right thing. (laughs) Um, It it has to be, there has to be a certain amount of scariness to it. Otherwise we're not growing and we're not, you know, stepping into something that's, that's helping us evolve and, and get to the place where we, we want to be like match our goals. If we're comfortable, we're not really, you know, growing or going anywhere. And it's actually a really good, like what we were saying before about noticing our intuition and, and working through intuition fears that come up when when we look at fear and we can name the fear, whether it's lack of self-confidence or we don't think that we know enough about something that we're going into, that actually makes it more accessible in the body. Like we feel, oh, it's not actually fear. It's just that I'm lacking confidence and then, oh, I can work on my confidence. And there's a striking balance between analyzing your emotions, but then also creating momentum behind them. So feelings of fear or anger or sadness or real trepidation come up, making a practice to feel fear and express fear and and anger and sadness in healthy ways creates the momentum to push you forward, um, if this makes sense. So when I say an anger practice, like if you're feeling angry, don't push it down, like go and punch some pillows or do some kickboxing or turn your music up really loud and scream, like get that anger out of your system so that you get to a point where you feel really calm, like you've had like this emotional purge, then that's vented. And then the momentum that you're left with is creative energy. It's the, oh, I've gotten rid of that anger. Now I can go and write my blog post or set up my website or start writing the film that I want to write. Like those are things that kind of get in our own way is our emotional our emotional bodies yeah so that brings up another thing that I wanted to ask you about because I've been learning more and more about how emotions affect us on a creative level on a physiological level as well and how like I have one friend who she noticed that when she consumes sugar, her feelings of self-doubt kick in big time. Like she just Um, had this realization one day that the more sugar she eats, the more she doubts herself. And then the less sugar she eats, the more confident she feels. And she's like, is that a real thing? You know, how does that make any sense? So how on a physiological level, what do you think is happening? And I don't know if you if you know the answer to this or not, but um, no, when... absolutely I do. So physiologically, when our blood sugars are going a bit haywire, because you know, we know that when we eat sugar, our blood sugar spikes and then it really drops again as our glucose tolerance factor and insulin kind of try to re re wrangle themselves. So this big surge in blood sugar actually creates a surge also in cortisols and stress hormones because the body there's like a stress feedback system the body thinks it's under stress so the cortisols create that flight or fight response right they're from the adrenal glands and then we we get into like those sorts of flight or fight flight or fight and fear-based thoughts because those hormones can't help but kind of put us into that mental state so physiologically that's what's happening and this is true for a lot of people that experience feelings of anxiety and they think that they have chronic anxiety when sometimes it's really that the diets just aren't supporting their body in a way that helps them you know neutralize hormonal and cortisol excretion in their system they just have way too much dumping into their system all the time which ends up leading to adrenal exhaustion which then ends up leading to depression so that's why anxiety and depression have a physiological connection as well for for many other reasons (laughs) so many things that go on in the body 
but that that essentially is what's happening there so the way to rectify that would be to have a little bit of protein with every meal make sure like your friend has stopped eating sugar that's awesome like that's the best thing but a bit of protein with every meal helps your blood sugars stay really really stable and so you feel much more grounded as you're going through your daily life does that help answer mm-hmm. that? <laughs> yeah, and that that reminds me of the, so the consultation that I had with you way back when we first met was because I had accepted a temporary position and I knew I was going to be working a lot more hours than I felt was yeah. physically possible, but for a short <laughs> period of time. <laughs> and I just had this hunch that my energy levels were really going to suffer. And I know for me, I have big time sugar addictions, and I knew that I would be craving all all the cat. I <laughs> I like to say <laughs> like I'd be going through one of my um, kombucha scoby moments where <laughs> I just consume caffeine and sugar and caffeine and sugar and caffeine and sugar. <laughs> and that's like my whole diet. Oh, and if you know about kombucha, then you'll get that joke. And if you don't, then don't worry about it. <laughs> but. <laughs> And I I didn't want that. I was trying to prevent that. And I'm like, how can I accept this work and know that it's going to require more energy? What can I do to sort of bolster that energy in advance and make sure that I have access to the right foods or the right support so that I don't just run myself completely into the ground? And that was one of the things you had told me was making sure every time I eat, I have some kind of protein and you had some other, it did help. I mean, I got through it, right? I did. You did. (laughs) You were amazing. (laughs) Because the other, the big advice that you gave me is something that I knew, but I need to hear repeatedly, which was, okay, you're setting yourself up this way temporarily, but you also cannot you also cannot continue this pace, right? Like you cannot perpetually work this many jobs and this many hours all of the time in terms of like a long-term lifestyle. And you know that there's going to need to be some shifts in the lifestyle to allow yourself more rest and more rejuvenation time. But sometimes it's good to like give ourselves a bit of a challenge, right? (laughs) It proves to us, you know, what we're capable of. Totally. But then there's like... The payback. There's a limit (laughs) to like... Because I think we also have a lot in our culture a tendency toward workaholism. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Or we just feel like we have to be productive all the time. Yeah. And then if we don't, you know, we're made to feel guilty and we're told we're bludges or whatever. I don't know if that's an Australian word. I mean, I think it is. I've never heard that before. Bludges. <laughs> <laughs> People that are, are not pulling their weight, basically. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's so strange. I did this exercise once where you think about the labels that you fear the most, the words that would really trigger you if somebody called you this word. And then you sort of Mm. like analyze what's behind that. Why is that so triggering for you? And I have always known like the worst thing somebody could ever say to me would be to call me lazy. For whatever reason, that word really triggers me. And if anyone were to ever say that about me, I would flip out. And I don't think anyone ever would say that about me. Absolutely not. (laughs) But it's like then you push and push to try to like make sure that you're the opposite of that, right? Which is also not not that rational or sane. It's an interesting paradigm that we live in. Uh, I think it is shifting a little bit because we're starting to really appreciate ourselves and our health and our self-care a lot more. And I think that has a lot to do with more and more women coming into the work industry. I could be wrong, but to me, that's what I've observed It is partly the line of work that I'm in and the type of people that I'm around, but I see so much more emphasis on self-care and Mm. holistic approaches to things and this idea of a feminine style of leadership. Yeah, more cyclic, more allowing rest when we need it, and then really taking charge when we know that we have a lot of energy. So we're utilizing our own energy cycles a lot better. And honoring emotions too, like our emotional state behind work and the kind of vulnerability that we get. And then the kind, like you were saying, how you don't want people to think that you're lazy. So you're working through that as well with your business and the work that you do. So we're using our own careers to be healing, which is, you know, something not ever done before, I don't think, in the history of. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting, it's very interesting times. Using your career to be healing. That's a topic I need to think about a little bit. 
I like that idea. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I have this, this is a total tangent, but I have this idea around entrepreneurship as personal development. And I've been even saying you should start a podcast as a form of therapy. <laughs> you know, mm. like, yeah, as, well, how good is talking? Talking is like the ultimate form of therapy. It's great. Right. And then I use my podcast to work through things that are happening in my mind, like behind the scenes. And at a certain point, I realized that sometimes those things that are happening in my brain behind the scenes, other people are also struggling with similar things and can relate to and actually find right. it useful. And then, oh, this helps me process what's happening because I can articulate it. And then by articulating it and then sharing it, it helps somebody else to articulate what's happening for them too. Yeah, you're tapping into the collective and attracting the people that need to hear what you have to say. That's awesome. So on this theme of feminine leadership and reworking this paradigm of needing to always be pushing and be working towards success and being productive, how would you define success? Like, would you say that your business and your practice right now is successful? Yeah, I think I define success as how I feel personally, like if I feel fulfilled, and if I feel happy, and that I feel like there is momentum and growth behind whatever I'm doing. And to me, that is success. So yes, I feel like I'm in a really great place with my business and what I'm doing right now that I have so much projected into the future, but there's so much that I'm doing currently to create that foundation and move forward into it. So I, I think I feel much more comfortable and happy in my career right now than I ever have before in like my, my almost 20 years of, <laughs> of working in, in natural medicine. What's challenging you most in your work or in your life right now? Hmm. I think that for me, it's, it comes back to that vulnerability thing again about being seen, like the things that we do on the internet become under such scrutiny. So even like this podcast, or I've been invited to do another podcast or doing Facebook lives, there's like, oh, uh, a fear that maybe someone will miss interpret like, something I say, or I'll say something a little bit wrong, and uh, then I'll get some kind of lashback. So I guess that's, that's what I find most challenging. But I, I think that's just practice will <laughs> overcome that. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> or maybe that will always be there. But that's kind of like, if you feel like an imposter you're probably not mm, and yeah. if you like if you're in a networking situation or something like that and you feel like you're being smarmy or salesy you're probably not if you have enough awareness to to ask yourself that question then you're probably fine <laughs> yeah true <laughs> self-awareness is key <laughs> and then I always like to ask my guests towards the end of the interview what advice or words of wisdom that you have for someone who's starting off on a new creative path or thinking of heading in a new direction? And I want to tailor that question a little bit for you and maybe mm -hmm. ask you if you have any, again, we have not paid for a consultation individually customized <laughs> with you. However, do you have any overall like general recommendations or tips or tricks or tools for somebody who's getting ready to take that risk and put themselves out there in a space of creative vulnerability to work through some of those feelings of self-doubt and have sort of like the anti-imposter recommendations? <laughs> Sure. There's, there's so many things I could recommend. I think what we spoke about before about feeling emotions and then working through them with anger practices and, and whatnot, venting them, that is a great place to start. But one of the things I'd really like to recommend are flower essences because they work pretty much instantly because they work on the energetic body. So the energetic body can then affect the physical body and the emotional body, if that, if that makes sense. So in Australia, we have Australian flower essences that were developed by Ian White. And in the Northern Hemisphere, that we have backflowers, which I sometimes say to people that if you live in Australia, it is better to consume the flowers that are native to where you live. Hmm. But these will work if you live in the, in the Northern Hemisphere too. Like these are, are across the board. But this is just a general if you really want to get specific about it. So 
say you're about to do, like today, I should have taken some bush fuchsia because that is a flower that really helps to open up the throat chakra and get you in a space of easily communicating and being in flow with your words. It's also really great for singers and bringing in that integration of feminine and masculine side of the brain. There's also a flower called dog rose, which is great for shyness and being apprehensive and fearful. So this one really increases your confidence and your belief in yourself. Five Corners is another flower essence for low self-esteem, and it increases joy and love and acceptance. There's also flannel flower. Little flannel flower helps to, to tap into your inner child, making creativity more playful. So as, as I'm describing these, you can see like how each flower has a very specific way of dealing with the creative self and the emotional self and the kind of blockages emotionally that we might have. In buck flowers, rock water is an, one that's great for expression and flexibility and wild rose is great for apathy. Aspen is the one for fear of the unknown and pine is great for taking creative risks. So that's flower essences. That's just a little brief kind of overall kind of look at them. And essential oils are really great too. Like you know that I love essential oils and aromatherapy. I'm always banging on about them. And citrus essential oils are both really great for breaking through fear blocks and uh, igniting the creative energy behind anything. So sweet orange oil is really one of my favorite ones to use for that. It's just really uplifting and, and joyous. But lemon and lime are also really nice. It depends on what your preference is. So when you something a good tip with aromatherapy is that if you like the smell of it, it's going to work really well for you. But if if someone says to you, "Oh, this oil is for this," but you hate the smell of it, it's not going to work positively mm -hmm. for you. So go for the one you like. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you feel like you really wanted to share with the listeners or anything that we didn't talk about or that you didn't get a chance to say that that you wish you had? No, I think I, I actually got to say everything that I wanted to say. But generally, if you're a creative person, you know, just go for it. If there's something that you want to do, if there's something that you've noticed is missing in your community and you wish that it was there, you know, just Go ahead and create something. Just take it on board as a sign for you that that's a little bit of a, a project you should pursue. That's a, a purpose for you right now. Create a creative community for yourself and the people around you and your friends. I have a few friends that have done that in the town that I live in. And through that, everyone has found so much, I guess, nourishment in a way that's creative but also in a way that's connecting them to other people and they can share their stories and their vulnerabilities and um, what motivates them. So really having a network that helps you, help support you through like your creative journeys is really important. Okay, I hope you were furiously trying to scribble down the names of all those flower essences or type them into the notes app of your phone. But don't worry, all of the notes on those recommendations Samantha just doled out to us, flower essences, essential oils, you know, I love the essential oils. They are all available in the show notes for today's episode at thecreativeimposter.com forward slash 054. You will also find there a link and invitation to have tea by the cauldron. <laughs> I love that name. A complimentary heart-to-heart -heart chat with Sammy all about your healing goals. Totally worth it. I mean, it's free and invaluable. Samantha also sent the following love note to help support us as we move into Thanksgiving here in the States and all of the winter holidays wherever you happen to be. Here is some of her best advice for this season. Look after your digestion by eating slowly and adding digestive enzymes to your diet. Foods like lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, homemade pickled foods, and unpasteurized miso paste will all help cultivate pre and probiotics in the gut as well. Be aware of your emotions and of maintaining boundaries that serve you. The holiday season can be a time where we have to face complicated interactions with colleagues, family, and friends. There can be a lot of pressure to attend every gathering, there can be shaming from certain people. We all have that one relative, right? Issues can come up with food and drink. Observe these if they arise, but don't judge yourself. 
These emotions are telling you to say no to the things you really could do without. Remember, it's okay to put yourself first and enjoy the holiday season on your own terms. Last and most important, stay hydrated. Such perfect advice. And Samantha also, at the end of the interview, had talked about the importance of finding or creating your own creative community. And as we move toward the new year, I am happy to invite you to check out our brand new Creative Imposter Studio memberships for 2018. You can learn all about them on my site, linked up, of course, in the show notes. Once again, that's the creativeimposter.com forward slash 054. And these are studio memberships available to you whether you live in Chicago or not. And in the meantime, join us over on the Creative Imposter Facebook group where I'm offering weekly live video meditations and so much more. You don't have to be doing this creative entrepreneurial thing all by yourself. There is a ready-made community waiting for you to contribute your own energy and receive that energy back in return. And if you can't wait for the next Facebook Live meditation, you can get an audio meditation direct to your email inbox that you can download and keep forever and listen to over and over and over again if you head on over to thecreativeimposter.com forward slash magic. This one is particularly good for navigating yourself in relationship to other people this season. And if you're already in the Creative Imposter email community, you've already gotten the meditation link. Just search for my name and the word Meta, M-E-T-T-A. This episode was mixed by Edwin Ruiz of Mondo Machine. Our theme music is by Jovia Armstrong. I thank you so much for listening, and I am sending gratitude to the creators of the Season of You self-care package, wishing happy Scorpio birthday to Samantha Mant, happy Scorpio birthday to me, and happy Thanksgiving and gratitude to all of my listeners wherever in the world you are.